Praise the Lord, everyone. Good to see you again on this blessed, beautiful day. Happy Sabbath. Um, today, we're going to talk about sin. And this is a topic that a lot of people, they get a little upset about. They don't want anybody to tell them anything about it. But we're going to talk about sin and the sacrifice you need to make. Sin and the sacrifice you need to make. And we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 6. And we're going to start off at the first two verses. Amen. And it reads, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And let's skip down to the 12th verse. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness for unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity, unto iniquity. Even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness, unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants of God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life for the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life through jesus christ our lord amen so as we read these scriptures we see that sin is not a good thing amen and some folks they think of sin they think of it as um lying simplistically they think of just lying they think of coveting they think of doing something wrong to somebody and all these are sin. Now, what is, let's think of a of a, a definition, an applicable definition for it. It is anything that goes against what God has told you to do, amen? Anything that goes against his word, amen? Anything contrary to that, that's sin, amen? And you want a good example of it? Let's, let's reach back to Adam again and, and to Eve in the garden. Um, God had told, told him, he said, don't fool with that tree. Don't fool with the fruit of it. You, you, you eat it, you touch it, you die. Don't fool with it. Okay. So time goes on and here comes the serpent and he starts talking to the woman. Amen. She has the word, the right word that we can't, we can't do anything with this fruit. We can't do anything with this tree, but this is how enemy the enemy works sin in. What he does is he talks to her and convinces her that that's not why God doesn't want them to touch it. That it's not sin, but it's because um, he know that they're going to be as God and they're going to be wise. So she gets all caught up in that and she sets aside the word that God had given her. Okay. And she chases after something opposite of God. That's the sin. And... Not only does she partake in it, her husband, who knows better, partakes in this. And she was the one that was tricked. He wasn't. He knew better. And it introduced sin to man. Amen? Because it was something that went contrary against what God has said. And so God comes and Adam and Eve, their eyes are open. And so they're hiding. 
And so God comes, he says, where are you? And he tells him basically he's hiding because he knew he was naked. And God said, well, who told you? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? And so they got in trouble and they played the blame game, amen? Adam said, you know, the woman you gave me, she did it. The woman said, the serpent beguiled me. And God punished each of them. He punished the serpent who had to crawl on the ground on his belly and eat dust. He punished the the um, the um woman. She had to be in subjection to her husband and her desires were to him and she would give birth with pain. And Adam, he would have to provide for his family by basically doing something he had never done, plowing, amen, and working. And by the sweat of his brow was how he was going to survive, amen? So the thing is, sin introduced some things that, that caused punishment, amen? Punishment came behind sin. Not only did these things, were they, um, was the serpent punished and the woman punished and Adam had to work hard, they also... Adam and Eve were put out of the garden and there was a flaming sword put there. So sin, as we can see in this instance or in this situation, separated man from God. Amen. God is not an unholy God and he does not partake with sin. Amen. So that's the thing about sin. Sin is not a good thing. As we said, it's contrary to what God said. And God is not going to partaking it he's not going to have it amen so if god tell you to do something you should and it and what you hear it lines up with god's word amen because you got to be careful how you hear because stuff will come to you and try to mimic god but it doesn't line up with him amen but when he speaks to you what he says lines up with what he has told you and what he says amen so we have to be careful not to have sin, amen? Sin gets you messed up, gets you doing stuff that you wouldn't have to do, amen? It got the Israelites into walking around the wilderness for 40 years until everybody that was uh, not right dropped dead in the wilderness, amen? So it caused them an extra journey in a way, amen? 40 years walking around the same wilderness because couldn't obey God, couldn't take his word, couldn't keep it. God said, yep, this is the promised land. This is what I'm going to give you. I have milk and honey in this land. This land is running over with blessings that I have prepared for you. Amen. And they're sitting up there, man, why you bring us out here to die? Would that we could go back to Egypt. We had, were better off in Egypt. We were slaves, but we were doing good. That's sin. Amen. God then told you to do something. You said, I don't want to do it. I want to do it this way. Punishment was death. As we have read, the wages of sin is what? Death. Amen. So you have to be careful that you don't put yourself in a situation where you are chasing after something that is contrary uh, uh, to the word of God. Something that is opposite to what God has said. Amen. Sin. So the question that was raised at the beginning of this chapter was, shall we can, shall, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Should we keep pursuing in this sin? Is it um, convenient for us to keep sinning? Amen. Because folks will tell you, well, you can't be perfect. Uh, you're going to make mistakes. You're not going to die every eye and cross every T. No, you, you, you might slip. But the thing is, when you become a new creature in Christ, you're perfect through Christ, amen? Which means you should have no business slipping if you keep yourself in Christ, amen? You should not have any issues, but sometimes we do mess up, amen? We'll have to say it. He said, all of sin comes short of the glory of God, but once you're saved, you that should not be your practice, amen? You might have the occasional accident, but it should not be a practice. That's what sin had became when it entered into the world it became a practice of doing what god against what god had said amen and so we have to be careful god it says god forbid don't be doing that don't be introducing and keeping sin going how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein you should be dead to it amen so you might have used to go out with the boys drink and party hardy and 
shoot up every weekend. But when Christ comes and he saves your soul and he takes that taste from you, you should be free of that sin. You should be dead to that sin, amen? That's what being dead to that sin means. It means I don't want to do that no more, amen? I don't want to get drunk anymore. I don't want to get high anymore. Like, I just want to follow Christ. And if I do get drunk and I do get high, it's going to be on the Spirit of God, on the Holy Ghost, not on these things that are on the earth, amen? So, we should be dead to this thing, and we shouldn't live in it any longer, amen? Some folks think that, well, I have this infinite uh, jar of forgiveness, amen? I can go smack Sam, and I can ask God to forgive me, and it's all said and done, amen? You should not do that, amen? If you turn to Hebrews chapter 6, and we're going to turn to it, and we're going to read it. It's chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, amen? Let's turn to it. And it reads, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So the thing is, he said, it's impossible for those that, you know, basically they've gotten into God. They've been enlightened by the word of God. Amen. They've tasted the heavenly gift of God, the word and spirit of God. It's impossible for them to fall back into mess. Amen. Because the word that they're given should keep them out of it. But what happens is we get the relaxed Christian that says, well, you know, I got forgiveness. But when you do this thing, it says, if they shall fall away, if you sin, you mess up, and you know better to renew them again unto repentance. They got to go back and repent again and go through that thing again, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put to an open shame. You don't want to be doing that, amen? Because when you do that, when you have a practice or ideology that, I can slip up whenever I want. I've got a, I've got an avenue to get it right again. You know, willingly do this thing. You get in trouble, amen. You waste what God has given, amen. You waste that sacrifice, amen. So, sin leads to death, amen. It causes death. It results in death. And if you look over in Mark, we'll get into it a little more about what sin can do, amen. Sin can make you sick, amen. And I'm sure there are folks that say, no, nah, germs make you sick. Sin can make you sick, amen? It's not just those, those little organisms that are crawling around, those microscopic things. Sin can cause it. And sin, in a way, we don't always see it, and we have to be careful that it don't creep on us, you know? Because some habits creep up on us, and it gets us in trouble, amen? It gets us into doing stuff that we wouldn't normally do, amen? We let our guard down and it slips in us, amen? So that's why we have to be careful. In Mark chapter two, some of you may know this story. There was a man that was sick with the palsy and Jesus is in a house and he's preaching and they can't get in because there's so many people there. Um, there was a, a apostle that preached on this scripture this week and we're going to read it. Amen. It says, and again, he entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noise that he was in the house. He was in a house. People heard about it. And straightway, many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. So it was, it was packed out. Amen. But he preached. And they come unto him. Bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. So you got these four people, these four friends, toting their friend who's sick, lying in that bed. He's sick with a sickness, amen? He can't move him, himself to where he want to go, amen? The bed has to tote him, and somebody has to tote the bed, amen? So it says, and when they could not come nigh unto him, for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. So they brought him. They knew one thing. They knew Jesus can fix this. 
they most likely they heard of the miracles that have been performed because that's what brings people to Christ. Amen. The signs and wonders that are written and that are done for through the saints and for the saints and for those that will be saints is what draws people back to God. Amen. They see the power of God. They find out that the situation I'm sitting in, it, I, I, it's not hopeless. I can get out of this thing if I get to him, amen? If I touch the hem of his garment, the mess that's bothering me will go away, amen? I don't have to have him come to my house and and pray over me. He can send his word and it'll take care of me, okay? So they heard that this man has power to heal, amen? So they bring him and they see that we can't get in the house. They ain't let that stop them. They kept on pushing, amen. They didn't give up. They didn't say, man, we might as well turn around and go home. But they said, so what they did was, it says, fit first, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Okay, so let's back up. So they saw that they couldn't get in the house. They go up on the roof, amen. They removed the roof. They uncovered the roof. And they let this man down through the roof, amen. And Christ sees the faith of this. He sees that they know that if they get to him, he'll get healed, amen. They know it, but Christ doesn't say, be ye healed or rise up and walk. What does he say? He says, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. The stuff that you've done, that you've messed up with, let them be forgiven, amen. I let that go. Amen? Because you got to remember, Christ is the mediator between the Father, between that part of himself for us. Amen? And you know what a mediator is, and if you don't, I'll tell you. A mediator is, is basically a lawyer or a spokesperson for you. Amen? You yourself are not allowed to speak in that setting. Amen? When you go to court, you have to have a lawyer in most instances. You have to have a lawyer to speak. Amen. And you can't really represent yourself. Now, in little petty stuff, you might be able to get up and say, yeah, they hit my car and backed into me and I want my damages. But when you get to something such as a criminal case or other cases that are complex and beyond that of the lower court, you have to have a lawyer. And this lawyer speaks for you on your behalf. Amen. Now, with Christ, he is our lawyer and our mediator to the Father. And he says, well, I paid for that sin. So he has power to forgive that sin. Amen. And so this was the thing that held this man up from being healed, from being and what kept him in that state. Amen. Something happened to him in his life and he got into the wrong thing and it made him sick. Amen. Remember, sin leads to death. Okay, so... It also can cause sickness, which leads to death as well, amen? It can change your whole life from being what it should be to being something that the enemy has wanted to introduce and it should not be, amen? So, the thing is, Jesus said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. I let this thing go so that I let it go. It says, and you know, there were folks in the house with him and they said, How's this man forgiven sin, amen? How is he able to do this thing? You know, it's blaspheme. Let's read it. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their heart. They're sitting there, they're thinking in their hearts. What's he doing? He can't do this. Why do if this man 